Laura is going to give you a quick introduction to what we're talking about today. We're going to be uh, featuring the mold work of uh, Ramiro Camarillo, who makes molds for the Art of Fire here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about molds in general. In the glass blowing, we use two types of molds. One of them presents us with nearly the finished product. And uh, I'm going to ask Foster Holcomb, our studio owner here, if you would mind picking up the mold that you use for the stemless wine glasses, Foster. Oh, right. okay. Made of wood. Made of wood. Uh, this is what's called a uh, two-piece mold. It has a single hinge. The glass is rotated within the mold so that there are no seams on the glass. And it's closed up, the glass is inflated, it's opened up, and the piece is basically the same size. It's attached to the punny iron on the bottom, and the mouth is heated and opened up to bring it to its completion. And then we start the process over again. Yeah, so the beauty of these molds is they give us nearly a finished product. And here's a sample of one of the stemless wine glasses that Foster had previously made using that. So this was, uh, yeah, and he'll enjoy, uh, it won't be quite, hold quite a pint, but it's a, it's a nice little drinking glass. So that's one type of mold. Another type of mold we use is called a dip mold or an optic mold. And for that, we create impressions in it. And we're gonna go down and see a couple of those in a moment, but here's some pieces that have that. This little vase right here has some ridges in it, and we'll show you the mold that creates those. And this ornament over here has a diamond pattern in it, and we'll show you how we use a mold to do that. And then these other really fascinating shapes that we have here are from the collection that Ramiro has made for us, and so we'll discuss those in greater detail. So let's uh, trot on down to where Josh Reese will be working. What you gonna make for us, Josh? Uh, we're gonna make a planner like some of the ones you saw hanging over at the table. Except for we're gonna be using this nifty little mold Romero made. Okay, so this mold has 12 surfaces. And in this one, unlike the mold for the uh, stemless wine glass that Foster used, you do not turn the pipe and blow. Because you can see it's got all those angles in it. So it's kind of kind of looks like a miniature dome home. But uh, there's a hole up in the top. The blowing iron goes down through that. The mold is held tightly together, and the glass blower blows out against it, and that creates the 12 facets in the piece. And then once it's extruded from the mold, then the glass blower can place it onto what's called a punty, which just is a, a temporary joint to another pipe and then he'll open it up. And Josh will be showing you that in just a moment. So we'll get out of the way here. He'll get his mold set up like he wants it, or I'll put it on the floor for him over here. So right have... now he's collected a small amount of colored glass on the end of the blowing iron, and he's melting that in. What color is that, Josh? That's cobalt blue. Cobalt blue, okay. So he's going to soften that cobalt blue chunk to the point that it's malleable, and then he'll roll it on the metal table over here, which we call a marver. And as he rolls on the marver, it also cools the glass a little bit. He tips the end of it down like that to cool that end of it, and then a little bit of shaping. And you can see the glass changes color. Now you see that orange glow the last three inches or so of the pipe. A lot of times people will ask us how hot is it to hold that pipe. You can see Josh has it gripped by about the midpoint. You could also see where it's tarnished from heat. Down in that zone it's really, really hot. It will burn, so we just don't grab that. He's gathering glass out of our furnace, which holds about 400 pounds of molten glass. That runs 24-7, 365, and it's powered by propane. And right now what he'll do is take a wooden tool, a cup, which we call a block, on a handle, and he'll use that to shape and stape inside the glass. Now if he pauses his rotation for a moment, you can see the constant battle of the glass blower against gravity. 
And if he were to spin it around like that, it'd be flopping around like a wounded duck. In which case, we usually tell folks, either get it centered or shoot it and have it for dinner. All right, so he's going to blow that out, trap a little air in it, and you'll see that color core expand. Now, it's not going to go into the mold perfectly like that. He needs to create a little bit of space that will be between that portion of the glass and the pipe. So he's chilling this up. And you're going to be taking another gather. Okay, so he's going to cover that up and then he will get it all shaped up to go into that 12-sided mold. And I'll those... go ahead and strip some of this off. Oh, okay. So Josh is going to strip for you all. And uh, <laughs> actually what he's going to do is he's going to gather a little more glass than he needs. Then by pointing the iron downward over one of the buckets, you can see the liquid nature of this material. It just flows right off. So now he's got just the right amount for making the piece and he's putting a color application on the surface. And this color application will later be uh, reduced, it's called, where he'll uh, use a torch and heat it up. We'll explain that when we get to it. After he gets a coating on there, he'll go to the reheating oven, which is over here, called the glory hole. That's running at a little over 2100 degrees. As the glass blower works, the glass cools off, and cold to a glass blower would be about 1600 degrees. So we need to get it back up to heat quickly so that we can work it. He'll use a slightly larger block now to shape it up, and he'll introduce some more air. This will inflate the glass on the end of the blowing iron, and now we'll see him get ready to separate it. So. We've got another glory hole over here, which isn't in use. And while he's heating the glass up, we'll give you a gander inside the glory hole. So it's basically a ceramic tube with a burner in it. And we only light those up when we need them. So right now he's going down and he's going to dip it in a bucket of water. And that's going to crackle the surface. So the glass is hot enough, this isn't going to fracture. But he's going to do this. He may do it a couple of times. It'll depend on how many cracks he gets. And what will happen is where each of those cracks of the line is, they will expand and stretch apart as he blows the piece out. So he's given it a good visual inspection. And we're going to go in for a little closer look. And you can blow again. So you can Let see the crackles in there. And every once in a while, Foster's feeling for air there to see if it cracked through. Did it? It actually cracked all the way through. It cracked all the way through. There's a hole on the end. There's a hole on the end. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to seal the hole or start over. More than likely, he'll seal the hole. So by rolling it against the metal tabletop, he can gradually close that up some. Or if he chooses, he could add a small bit of glass to the end. And it looks like that's going to be the choice du jour. All right, so he's using a pair of metal blades now called jacks. And he's separating the piece just a tad. And he's going to take the bit iron from Foster and attach the glass and cut it off. So now he's covered up that hole on the end. And since he's going to make a hanging planter out of this, it really won't interfere with the finished product. If we were making an ornament, it might interfere. Okay, so now we've got that solved. And he's going to continue to heat that up. And then you'll never have that happen. Never have that happen. And now you'll see in just a few moments after he shapes this up. Very important to get the shape right. Now, somebody just commented they were on their third scotch, so perhaps they didn't notice. Okay, we're going to keep on going from there. All right, so the keep on going from there. All right, so the mold is down here. He's going to put the glass into the mold. He's doing a test fit there fit there. Then he'll use his uh, feet to close the mold and 
Then he'll use his uh, feet to close the mold and hold it tight while he blows. And when he comes out, you'll see that 12-sided figure. Now I know that a 12-sided figure when drawn flat in two dimensions is a dodecahedron, but I don't know if that applies to a three-dimensional. There he goes to close it up. He starts blowing really hard. A lot of force in the feet to keep that from spreading apart. Then he'll kick it open. And after he kicks it open and wiggles it free, we've got the, the final shape of the product right there. So now we can see the 12 panels in the glass. What he's doing right now is creating a point to separate this from the blowpipe. You also get a really good view of the cracks in it. I do the pipe first, please. Foster is preparing what's known as a punty or pontal. It's a small piece of glass that he'll uh, have on the end of the iron. You can see it's just right up on the tip of the iron. He has shake that up and bring it over to Josh. They'll place it on the bottom of the piece, right in the center, and then they'll break it free of the blowing iron. Yeah, a 12-sided glass dice. Exactly. Josh will be getting out his marker later to put all the, the dots on it. Okay. So now he's going to place the punty or pontal onto the bottom of the piece. He'll turn the entire assembly, both irons, so that he knows that it's running true and centered. A little drop of water on the joint and then a tap with his tweezers and it breaks free. So now he's successfully done what we call the transfer. Sorry if there's bad sound associated with the video. We have a lot of exhaust fans in here, and particularly since we're in the midst of a, a pretty severe heat wave on the East Coast, we're not going to turn them off. So they do make a lot of noise, and there is a lot of uh, background noise from the fans that Norm Runnel, Norman, normally running the equipment. Josh is reheating this. He's got it to a depth to where that neck, where the extension on the top of the piece will be mostly hot. When he brings it back to the bench to work it, you'll see that it blows much more than the bottom of the piece. There's also some blow in the upper shoulders. So he'll be really careful as he does this not to distort that, and he can even use the jacks or other tools to retain the shape if it should start to move. Foster's using a, a wooden paddle now that flattens the lip. And in that way, we've got a uh, problem with sound and okay, energy. Cool. Yeah, well, I, I say let's uh, leave it like this, Foster. We'll just keep it as a little... There's not much uh, we can do about it right now. The sound is going to be, right. and our internet connection is not always the greatest in we'll here. We'll make it even louder. Yeah, now he's going to torch it, and it's going to get even louder. Here we go. Now that it's relatively quiet, you can see the uh, surface of that. It's of what we call reduction. And the glass chemistry in this is such that when you put an oxygen-starved flame to that glass, it actually pulls the oxygen. It, the flame is seeking oxygen to burn, and that's what's being removed and causing the change in color. Thank you, Bonnie. We really appreciate that. We think it's a really cool shape, too. So rather than a hanging planter, it's going to be a desktop planter or a pencil holder there you go. or a small vase or a 12-sided vase, whatever you want to call whatever it. We can come up with a million names, some of which are not really rated for family consumption. All right, so now let's move on down here. And that was using the 12-sided pole next to it and even the blue one up there. So these are what we call a diamond-shaped ornament. And we'll get down here a little bit lower so we can see the mold. There's the mold right there. Same principle. Would you kick it closed, Foster? 
You can see the small hole in the top where the glass will extend from the blowpipe and go down into the mold. Foster will be holding that shut with his foot and blow against it. What color will you use, Foster? I'm going to use a multi-color on clear. Okay. So and, he's going and, to... Uh, it's, it's what we refer to. It's what we refer to as a stationary mold. The mold that I showed you earlier to make the stemless wine glass, that was referred to as a rotational mold, where the glass is rotated within the mold so that there is no seam. This type of a mold is a stationary mold, and where the edges of the mold come together, if you will, represent seams. Okay, so this is the color he'll be picking up. We'll first gather some clear glass from our furnace, and this uh, granular glass here we call Brit, and it's just ground up glass. We can get it in different uh, diameters, we can get it very fine, we can get it in a powder, and we can get it into some fairly large chunks too. So Foster's going to gather clear glass from the furnace over there, and we only melt clear glass in the furnace. We could melt blue by adding uh, cobalt oxide to it, and we'd have a furnace full of blue glass. And it would probably take us about a week or more to make 400 pounds of blue glass. So we'd rather add the a color to the clear. So Foster's going to gather the clear up, and then he'll begin working the piece. And in a few moments, you'll see him drop that glass into the diamond mold. And Make just to reaffirm, the reason the glass blowers turn their pipes is to help keep the glass centered. Otherwise, gravity pulls at the glass. So by rolling the hot glass across the frit, it adheres. Okay, Fred really likes Glenlivet. We got any uh, Ardbeg fans out there? Any of you, any of you folks from the UK, interest more interested in the Petey? Okay. Oh, and of course there's Lagavulin. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so Foster is reheating now. And if he decides he wants any more color, he'll come back and roll the pipe through the color. More than likely, he'll just start the shaping of the glass. Because you can see he's got all those colorful spots now on the gathered glass. Again, a restriction near the blowpipe does two things. It will constrict it so it will break free easily. And then the other thing is it will give him a little bit of extension for the piece to fall down into the mold. So there's our shape. He's going to go back for more heat. So we'll get a good look at the mold there. You'll see how he drops the iron down. The glass falls into the mold. Gets it a little bit closer. Holds it shut with his foot and blows hard against it. You might see some steam come out in a moment. A lot of air pressure on there, and then he'll release. When he does, he'll kick that away, remove the piece from the mold, and there is the shape. Okay, so now, since this mold is designed to give you nearly your final shape, all he'll have to do is use his jacks, the metal blades again, to create a point of separation. He'll drop the ornament into a holder that we have sitting here on the bench, and then put a hook on it. So all that chilling with that metal right there cooled the glass off and gave him a nice place to fiddle right there. He's not cutting the glass, he's creating a point for it to fracture. It's chilling it, he'll tap the pipe with the shears, the pipe will break free of the ornament, and then he'll be able to take another gather, a small gather on a much smaller iron, bring that over and form the hook.
got a little bit of glass on the end of an iron. And he'll come over. He's got that to shape as he wants. Drops it right onto the ornament. And then he'll draw it up and thin the glass out some. He'll use his shears to pull on it and bring it up even a little higher. And then after he cuts it, clips it free, he'll use his tweezers to form the book. There's that little bit of glass sticking up there, a little curl to it, and right in place. We use an insulated glove because he's going into some 900 degree heat here with it. He'll put it, hold it up by the hook, and there we go. Beautiful. All right, so he's going over to the annealer right now. That's that box of bricks over there. This is the longest part of our glass blowing process. Okay, for about eight hours after this is shut off, the heat will be released very slowly so that the stresses are removed from the glass gradually. Were we to take our pieces and lie them on the floor immediately after completion, usually within about a half hour, they'd be shattered. So what we're going to get into next is a couple of dip molds, if you will, or molds that are made to shape. Now, this one here, you can kind of see down in there, it looks like rows of shark's teeth. And these are kind of like diamond points, and this is called a diamond mold by many glass blowers, or a pineapple mold, because quite often when people use that, it gives a shape. So here's an ornament, and we'll get an angle on this so you can see. So you can see the diamonds formed there. So there are four lines around each depression in the glass, and that's what gives us the diamond or the pineapple shape. So this is this is a dime a dozen. Well, actually not a dime a dozen. These are very expensive molds in shops. But what Ramiro has done for us is make one with ball bearings. Now I'm going to try and get an angle on this, and you can see that there are several rows of ball bearings that have been welded together, and each ring has been laid on top of the one below. And I'm not sure if we'll be able to see, can't quite see the bottom, it's a little dark in there, but it comes to a point like a bullet. And what's really interesting about this is instead of a diamond shape or four lines, it gives us six. So we'll show you what it's going to look like here in a moment. This is the pattern right here. Each of those depressions in the center of each group is where the ball bearing was. The thicker points of the lines is where the glass was forced out by the glass blower's high pressure air into the spaces between the ball bearings. So since there were two ball bearings right above this one, you get these two lines. There were two ball bearings on either side here, forming these two lines, and then down here, these two lines. So that's how we get this hexagonal shape. And we're gonna go back on down to Josh's bench and we'll get a demonstration of this. We're gonna make us a vase, Josh? Uh, kind of a round honey pot. A honey pot, okay. You know, on construction sites, that has a totally different connotation. Yes. But you're, 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 you're talking about the edible honey. Okay, very good. Just wanna make that clear. So you'll be using the uh, gold or gold brown colors? Yep. Okay. Now he's taken a chunk of the glass out of the annealer. He placed it in the annealer, which is running at 900 degrees all day long. And he put that in there about 10 minutes ago or so. And that's actually heated it up to the point that it doesn't crack from thermal shock. You'll notice that the heat of 2100 degrees, the thermal shock would crack it. And in fact, if the glass gets cold enough, it will crack on its own without a thermal shock. When Josh brings that glass out of here, you'll see that what was a solid cylinder, about an inch and a half long, two inches long, is going to be much more of a blob, and it'll be rounded. He'll bring it over to the marver and shape it again. This will probably have a bit of an orange glow to it as he brings it over, and you'll see the color change as the glass cools. We'll bring it over to the marver, wipe the marver to make sure there's no other glass on there, 
And by rolling it just like that, he gets a nice smooth shape on it. Perfectly centered. By rolling it on the tip, he shortens it a little bit and he also rounds it. Notice the kind of bullet shape to it. He'll introduce a little bit of air and you'll see that throw just a little bit. We don't want a whole lot in right there. Now glass blowers use a, a trick which is called blow and cap. They put the pipe into their mouth, blow, cover the hole with their finger, and the compressed air that's trapped inside pushes out in the glass. Josh has to let that glass cool a little bit before he goes and gathers again. If he didn't, the extreme heat of the 2000 degree molten glass would just penetrate right through the little bubble he put in. So it's got some stability in its core, and you can see that core kind of a darker sh shadow in the middle of the bright glow. Again, with the wooden block, we keep the blocks in water, and also the blocks are cut and green wood is used. What kind They're, of wood? Any fruit wood would do, but our favorite is cherry. <clears throat> In the UK, they use a lot of pear wood. Pear wood? Pear okay. Wood. Yeah. Any tight grain fruit wood would work. The tight grains and the water and the lack of drying out gives us actually a nice bed of steam to roll the glass on. So that's really what it's doing. That's how we get that beautifully symmetrical shape. And we put a little uh, skin, if you will, on the outside of the glass to give it some stability. We don't want to fight the centering it's, a, it's really a pain to have to deal with glass that's always falling off center. And it will fall some. You probably won't even notice a lot of the minute uh, motions that Josh uses. But every once in a while, if he detects it off center a little bit, he'll pause the rotation and then pick it up again. He's going to blow in again, and he'll probably, he's going to blow and cap his finger over the end. We'll go down here and take a look at the bubble extend into the glass. And it didn't take a lot of air pressure. When the glass is hot, an asthmatic could actually blow glass. That's not an issue. The hardest part of glass blowing is controlling it, keeping it centered. Now, at that time, he just brought the mouthpiece up to his mouth and did what we would call a free blow or mouth blow. Okay. He's got wet newspaper there, which is really a perfect insulator. With about seven sheets of newsprint folded up tight into about a eight by eight square and then soaked in water, he's able to grab the glass with his hand without being dumb enough to actually do so. Sometimes. Now he's chilled that off so that he can gather again. We're back over to the furnace. You can kind of see the flame in the back over there, keeping that thing hot all the time. So now he'll have a much larger gather of glass. And we gather in stages rather than try to get it all at once. If we tried to get it all at once, we probably could with a larger diameter iron, but it would be very difficult to control. So we're using that central core of stabilized glass to help control this really large gather. And he used a really large block. And here we go with the outer coloring. So the core and the outer coloring are, are two slightly different colors, aren't they, Josh? Yes. Gold color and the opaque brown gold color, rather, in the center is going to give him a nice mixture when he goes to get the finished product. Either color alone would probably look very nice, but if he's he's really making a honey pot for the all you Winnie the Pooh fans, we want it we want it to look authentic. Okay. Going through the gold colored frit again. Getting a little bit more on the end of it. The angle that he holds the iron is very important. You'll notice then he changes the angle. Now his hands are up high. Now he's down to level with the iron. Sometimes he points it upward. He's using gravity and the flow of the glass. Now he's going to blow and trap the air again, just for a moment, and he'll get some expansion. Very important that he gets this glass formed 
to the shape of the mold he's going into. So he knows he's really close to the right diameter. He has to have the correct ratio of length to diameter. That will affect the piece much later on when the, if the glass were to get too thin. And he may even take a quick look by holding it down toward the mold, but not actually going all the way in to make sure that he's close enough to the sides. He wants this to be enough of a tight fit that it'll go in, not so tight that it'll bulge over the sides, but he doesn't want a large gap between the glass and the side walls. If he had that, the glass would blow out too thin. So here is the ball bearing mold that Ramiro Camarillo made for us. Josh is going to bring the diameter down just a little bit more on that. You saw that when he went into the mold before with his test fit, it had just a little bit more than he wanted there. And there we go. Now we want to get the glass really hot. And then it's going to take quite a bit of air power, not so much to blow the glass, but really throw it out into the side walls. He could inflate this quite easily without massive air pressure were it not for the mold, because he wants those ridges to remain in the glass throughout the creative process. He has to make sure that they're deeply embedded in the glass. So he's getting this glass extremely hot. There it's in the mold, but watch him. He's blowing really hard, forcing it in there. Then he has to suck in on it and pull it out. And he got it out. So that's one of the things that sometimes happens is that the glass is so hot and it goes into those recesses that it wants to stick. But you can see the beautiful pattern he has there and that's well worth it. Of course, I can say that because I wasn't working on pulling it out of the mold. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's easy for me and Foster to admire and say that, yeah, it was worth the trip. So now what Josh is doing is cooling the end of the piece on the barber so that when he blows it out, it doesn't get too thin. He's back to the bench now. He's using the metal blades of the jacks to create a constriction near the blowpipe. This is where the piece will separate when he's done. The larger the diameter of the glass, the greater the heat that's generated. So it does get a little hot on your arm. However, you can't just tell glass blowers by the missing hair on their forearm. Okay, he's opened the glory hole doors a little bit for more access. Also to broadcast more heat onto his face. He's heating the entire piece now. He wants this to expand evenly. Where it will only heat half of it, it would not expand evenly. But there we go with a nice spherical shape. This is where we start most of our vessels. We get a good look at this as he turns it at the bench. Let gravity elongate it. We get a really, there's a really great look at all those hexagonal lines. And he managed to keep all of those despite the great amount of inflation because when he did that in the mold, it blew so very hard that the glass was thrown out into the recesses. If you don't blow hard enough, if you don't get the glass in the recesses, then what happens is as you work the piece, you lose the lines. You no longer have the optic impressions. Now they're going to put what's called a cheater or a button on the bottom of the piece. If you saw the small piece that Josh did earlier. They did that to seal a hole. Now it's to protect the bottom. Foster presents the iron. Josh attaches the glass to the bottom of the vessel and casts it off. Now this is just like a little bit of insurance. If the bottom were to get too thin, 
when we break it free of the putty iron, it could conceivably crack. So right now, Josh has the bottom of the piece flattened, a slight dimple placed in it. He'll keep reheating the glass, what we call flash heating, and Foster will form the putty. So he'll make one more trip over to the glory hole, give it a very short reheat just to make sure that it's not cold. It wasn't there very long. And as Foster shapes the putty, he'll bring it over, present it to Josh, and Josh will attach it to that cheater bit or that button that's in the bottom. And then when we break the piece free from the putty, that's where it will come from. Josh centers it up. That little dip there was to ensure the seal against the bottom when he lifted the iron up off the bench. He can press on that iron to keep it centered. You can see, those of you that are wood turners, that it's running true. And when he's happy with that, a little drop of water into the jack line or neck line. He checks with Foster to make sure that the piece is still stable at the bunny. And he taps it off and there we go. When we make vessels, we typically work the lower half to two-thirds first. Then we turn the vessel around, we attach it to a putty, and then we open the top half. So what you saw formed on the blowpipe was the lower portions of the putty pot. And now Josh will heat primarily the upper reaches, the lip, and he'll begin to open it. When he comes back to the bench, you'll be able to see a fairly small constriction and that's going to be the opening where he had compressed it at the blowpipe and that would well I would hold a lot of honey but it sure would play hell trying to get much in there so he's going to open that up so that you can actually put some honey into it so he comes back he'll take his jacks We'll start working the lip here in a moment. He's using a pair of shears to cut the lip. So the glass where the lip was was a little bit thick in spots. It wasn't quite as straight as he wanted. So now what he's doing is just rounding it back out. He bend that lip a little bit, and it looks like Foster's preparing a lip wrap. Is that what we got going on, Josh? Yeah. So Foster has a, another color over here. What have you got, Foster? Black. Black? Okay. So this lip wrap, how hot is the furnace? 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and are all the furnaces heated to the same temperature? No, they are not. The main furnace that scores the molten glass runs at 2,000 degrees. The reheating ovens, the glory holes, we run at old into this black brick. And in a few moments, he'll come over and present that to Josh at the bench. And Josh will take the pipe from Foster, grab it with his shears, and then trail the glass onto the lip. So we'll have a contrasting lip wrap on this. Foster's going to go back over to reheat at the furnace because it's getting a little crowded over there in the glory hole. When Josh is ready, he'll return to the bench. He'll let Foster know. They'll coordinate when Foster has the glass hot enough, and you'll see them lay the glass onto the lip. And we'll move in a little bit closer as they get ready to do that. Foster will go behind Josh's bench. Josh will grab it. He'll tag it up and pull back a little bit. And then as he rotates the pipe, the black glass peels off onto the lip only. Then he'll cast the glass away. It separates from Foster's pipe. And now we have the black lip wrap on the gold honey pot. So now it's a matter of making sure that the lip is flat and round 
and then uh, they'll open it on up. Yeah, so somebody did ask a question about the furnaces, and as Theta pointed out, the annealers are running around 900 degrees, and that's so that the glass won't slump. If our, if our glass is in the annealers at 1,000 degrees or so, it'll start slumping some. So we put the pieces in there till the end of the day. Uh, yes, Stuart, sometimes you can use the glass that, uh, to rework it, particularly if you've got clear glass. So I'm going to come around here. Josh is opening the lip. Foster is using the paddle to flatten the lip. And between the two of them, not only have we increased the diameter and the opening, but Josh is now forming a folded neck or lip on it, while Foster flattens the end. We'll get a view from back here, so you can see how that fits in, so the two of them working together. So the nice thing about working with the opaque and the transparent is you get the highlights where it's thicker on those little honeycombs. Aha! Uh -huh. Beautiful. So Josh will take a couple of reheats here, make sure that the temperature is equalized, and then in just a little bit, Foster will put on a pair of insulated gloves and they'll take it off. But he wants to make sure he's got all the shaping done as he wishes. So he'll use the jacks. When he's on the inside like that, he's working on the inner opening. Right there, he's working also on the shape and the slope of the neck. You can see how he brings the jacks back toward the piece. That gave the shoulder a little more slope. Yes, Bonnie, it's going to be a honeypot. And as we pointed out earlier, not the construction site kind. Okay, so Foster's gloving up over here. We've got insulated gloves. This glass is going to be probably at least 1,200 degrees or so when Foster takes it. So. He's got to protect his hands. He's got these insulated gloves. Josh will make sure that everything's lined up just exactly as he wants. When he's ready, a couple of drops of water right onto the punty, then a tap with his tweezers, and it comes off in Foster's gloved hands. And there it goes. It's broken free. Foster will bring it over to the annealer. Josh has got the doors open and Foster will put it down in there. And there it'll sit till the end of the day. And then when we turn things off at night, the glass slowly cools down. It'll take about eight hours, eight or nine hours for that to come down to room temperature. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, Marvelous. Thank you. Beautiful thank piece. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you. And we look forward to hearing from you. If you're interested in any of the pieces that you saw made today, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We can ship nationally, internationally, and bottom line is we hope that you enjoyed and learned. That's the bottom line. Thank you very much. Take care, be safe, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. All right, and uh, hang around for Jacob. He's next with the woodworking. Yep. and. Uh, and we're a little bit short of an hour, but we're we're exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> so. and Jacob's link is in our description. So if you want to get to his live in a couple minutes, just go to our description, and he's the next one up. All right, and I just saw somebody's question flash across the screen. Can you do this craft alone? Yes, you can for larger pieces or more complex stuff. Two is always easier, but one can do it. So thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, folks. All right. Thank you.